CR in Iraq. The second main reason is that uh, literally people are running out of money. Because when you leave Iraq and you're a refugee, by law, you're legally not allowed to work in the country uh, that you go to. So if you're not able to find a black market job or have someone there that can support you or are rich enough or have enough money put away to support yourself, when your money runs out, what are you going to do? Um, so you, you, you go back home. And that's why those are the two main reasons why uh, these 30,000 people are going back. Less than 20% of those 30,000 people returning their homes are doing so because they want to. So just, just a couple of, of analyses that, that I could give of, of take the information being spewed by the corporate media about what's actually happening on the ground. And, and interesting things happen when you give context and when you give real facts about what's happening on the ground. But again, um, a little bit more overall context just to update you on the situation on the ground. Um, I. I want to talk about the, the number of people killed in Iraq, but I want to start with a personal story uh, to, to underscore why most of these deaths you never hear about and you never will. Um, I have a, there's a man that I met in Bakuba. I, I, I talk about him in my book several times. Uh, his name is Sheikh Adnan. I met him when I was in there doing interviews uh, at the very end of my first trip, actually. So this is back in January 2004. And then we became friends and stayed in touch. He's, he's a Friday speaker at his mosque, a very religious man, um, an Islamic scholar at, at Baghdad University, and had actually written a book, a little book called Jesus and the Holy Quran, um, because he thought it'd be a good idea to try to have something to offer US soldiers when they came into the country to show similarities between Islam and Christianity rather than the differences being harped on by the media. So this, this gives you an idea of the kind of guy that Sheikh Adnan is. And uh, I'd come to Baghdad and, and, and be working, and he'd stop by my hotel after he'd gone to his classes at, at Baghdad University, and, uh, or, or come in from Bakuba Strait just to bring me home-cooked meals from his wife, because he knew I was just eating like street kebabs all the time. And um, uh, just a lovely guy. And then when it got too dangerous for me to keep going back into Iraq, he uh, started coming out to Syria, or Jordan, to visit me. And this past summer, when I was over in Syria reporting on the refugee situation, he came out to visit me again, and uh, we spent time. And uh, then I, I came home from the trip, and he had come out to visit me in Syria with a friend of his who also spoke good English. And a couple of months after I got home, I, I heard from his friend, I got an email, and uh, he said, well, what happened, Sheikh Adnan had gone to visit his parents, as he does every week, and he was coming back home in his car, and he had his 10-year-old daughter with him, and they were pulled over by a, 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 a car full of gunmen. And uh, they were pulled over, and uh, they sent a the little girl home, and they said, well, we're just going to take your father, we have to ask him some questions. And so they, uh, two of them got in the car with guns on him, and they, they drove him away in his car, and that's it. And that's... That's it, and it's uh, you know, and, and, and basically, when you look at the news uh, coming out of Iraq every day, and you see, well, the Iraqi police uncover twelve bodies in a field outside of Akuba, or scores of bodies walk up, wash up on the beach of the Tigris River. Um, you know, this he he's one of those. So they they basically rarely, if ever, makes the media. No one will ever see or hear from or, or, or know what happened. And, and that's the situation. Um, most of the deaths don't get reported in, in the media at all. And so when we look at the overall situation, uh, with, with that story in mind, multiplied countless numbers of times, that's why when we, we have something like uh, the report that was published in the British uh, peer-reviewed medical journal Lancet in October 2006, uh, otherwise known as the Lancet report, that found 655,000 Iraqis, or 2.5 percent of the total population of the country, had died as a direct result of the invasion and occupation. That, when that first came out, that figure shocked a lot of people. But uh, people like me and other journalists who have spent enough time in Iraq to see the apocalyptic nature of, of the occupation and how violent and completely out of control it is. It, it, it wasn't that shocking, actually, and especially when me and I, I don't know how many of my colleagues know so many Sheikh Adnans that that type of thing has happened to. 
So, but as is, is incredibly high as that figure is, we have updated figures. We have a group in the U.S. called Just Foreign Policy that uh, has taken a, a figure, uh, they base their figure primarily on the Lancet study and then extrapolated information from UN data, media reports, etc. And they've come up with a new number and that number is significantly higher. And one of the main reasons it's, it's significantly higher is because the legwork for that study published in the Lancet, it was published October 2006, which is already over a year out of date, but another reason is because the legwork for that study took place um, uh, in July 2005. So we, we basically have no new data on the number of dead from, from July 2005 until now. In, in between July 2005 and now, we've seen um, periods of some of the, the heaviest violence of the entire occupation. And so just foreign policies figure is now over 1.1 million Iraqis have died. There's a, a similar type of organization in the UK, um, uh, a polling group that uh, did their study, and their study is actually 1.2 million dead Iraqis. And in the United States, uh, a country with a population now a, a, a bit over 300 million people, um, I, I, I haven't done this uh, in Canada, so I can't uh, give you something a little bit more tangible, closer to home, to really try to, to drive this home. But in the United States, if we were going to show comparable casualties of a similar percent of the same percentage of people that would have died in the United States, it would mean that every person in Atlanta, Denver, Boston, Seattle, Milwaukee, Fort Worth, Baltimore, San Francisco, Dallas, and Philadelphia would be dead. Every single person. And when we consider the fact that Iraq's population, when the, when the invasion was launched in March 2003, was 27 million people, it's now around 23 million people. Because, as I said before, there's, uh, according to the UNHCR, there's a minimum of 2.25 million people internally displaced within Iraq, refugees within their own country. There's at least another two and a quarter million that have fled the country altogether. And these are very, very conservative figures. Um, there's a minimum number of three million people that have been significantly wounded. And according to an Oxfam International report published this last July, four million Iraqis are in dire need of emergency aid. For example, 70% of the country does not have access to potable water. So the four million, and these are not the refugees, so the four million, these are people that if they don't get water, food, and uh, emerge, uh, uh, medical attendance uh, uh, as they need it soon, they're literally at risk for their lives. So when we add all these numbers up and the number of dead, that means that over 50% of the total population of Iraq are either displaced, wounded, in need of emergency assistance, or dead. But things are getting better in Iraq if you listen to the corporate media. I want to uh, read two things from the book. Uh, one I'd like to read is about um, a short bit of uh, from when I went into Fallujah during the April 2004 siege. And again, to give you uh, a bit of a taste of what it really uh, felt like uh, to be in Iraq, particularly in, in the middle of a conflict zone. Um, and I decided to go into Fallujah because uh, there uh, were no reporters in the city aside from two correspondents with Al Jazeera. And the military was doing everything they could to keep journalists outside of the country, they had co or outside of the city. They had coordinated off the best they could. They were doing things like turning away aid convoys, turning away media vehicles, and in fact, they were trying so hard even to get the Al Jazeera correspondents out that they set up this ruse that they were going to be doing negotiations on April 9th. The siege started on April 4th. And they were so troubled by the fact that Al Jazeera was airing footage of American snipers shooting civilians, American snipers uh, shooting ambulances, warplanes bombing civilian homes, etc. This was not helping their image across the Arab world. And so, uh, 
uh, when the U.S. were trying to set up truce negotiations for April 9 with resistance fighters in the city, one of their demands was that the Al Jazeera camera crew leave the city. So on April 9, uh, hearing about these atrocities, I, I, I had the chance to...